Hi, Doc. So this next fellow's name is Derek, and he says, Hi, Doc. I'm a 55-year-old white male from South Africa. Please let me know if providing my blood bloods are good, I can stay on the following without breaking until I'm 90 years old. What's wrong with a, you know, 100? Why, why are you picking 90? <laughs> TRT of 150 to 200 milligrams per week of test propionate together with a round of 150 to 200 milligrams per week of decadrolin for my joint pain. Do I ever, he puts in caps, need to give this a break or is it safe to continue for years and years? Thank you, Doc. Cruise. <laughs> so, <laughs> Cruise. <laughs> well, again, I gotta be careful because yeah. I don't know enough about you, Derek, and really, listen to me. Please hear me, listen to me. Um, I could give you some general advice, but without knowing you and without you being my patient, I'm not just trying to do this just to you know, CYA and avoid liability and all that stuff. I really mean it in terms of uh, being a good physician and being of help to you. Without knowing all the individual nuances of you and your body and your blood work, I can't give you a for sure. And I recommend you get, you know, professional advice. But in general, uh, I can respond by saying, yeah, TRT for the average person, for most people, is going to make you more likely to make it to 90 and if not, at least match your longevity if you weren't to use it, certainly to improve your quality of life. I mean, we're seeing that. Uh, the problem with studies like this is, you know, these are generational studies. So we'd have to go in the next 500 years, let's say, before we had really top, uh, um, uh, top-notch data in terms of quantity. And then you get into, you know, random trials and all that kind of stuff. This is going to be one that is going to be more... Uh, based upon observations than anything else. But, you know, we can also use some common sense, which can, I agree, be dangerous in medicine sometimes, but think about it. If we can avoid certain morbidities, for example, we know that we can use testosterone and or anabolic steroids to put more muscle mass on an individual, assuming that individual's doing everything else right too, mm -hmm. still gotta do your training, eating right, sleeping right. Mm -hmm. But if this individual's diabetic, we provide a glucose sink, right? for that individual with diabetes by putting more muscle mass on the frame. I have used it in my practice for at least 10 years, maybe longer, to help reverse diabetes. It's been fantastic to watch as uh, we can get someone off medication sometimes, um, but certainly reduce the insulin if they were on insulin. Um, uh, there are guys out there that, uh, I won't name names, but uh, have no problem with me talking about them that will attest to this. No pun intended with the test, but um, my point is that um, it makes sense that you're going to live longer if we can control your diabetes than not, and, and to control it with uh, testosterone creating more muscle mass and all the other things that come with uh, testosterone that can also be beneficial. It seems like a pretty good idea as opposed to using, say, insulin only, which can come with a lot of drawbacks, uh, besides just controlling you know, uh, diabetes, which obviously is a positive. So... Um, I hope that made sense. Anyway, in terms of the protocol you're describing here, um, to use tes testosterone propionate, when you say you're using 150 to 200 milligrams per week, I would hope that that's in divided dose because the short half-life of testosterone propionate would make it so that you're on kind of a roller coaster ride of uh, T levels anyway, if you use the, the probe just once a week. Okay, uh, so divide that dose up if you want to add that. I don't understand the re rationale for using testosterone propionate though when we have a longer ester. I just. You're I, not a fan, I know. Yeah. I've heard the explanations. <laughs> Maybe there is something to. I would go so far as to say there's definitely something to it if enough bodybuilders say, no, 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 it makes a difference as to how I look on stage or I use propionate coming into the show than I do sipionate. But that aside, why would you want to give yourself more sticks per week? Yeah. Why would you want to use a shorter half-life, especially when propionate uh, can give you the, uh, the, the, what do they call it, the, not the bottle flu, that's for tequila. But, uh, you know, they, they called it the, the flu-like symptoms when you give yourself an injection. It stings and, a little bit more. Well, it definitely stings, yeah. but also, you know, when you get too much of the, whether it's benzoyl benzoate or sodium benzoate, uh, benzoyl alcohol, whatever the, the excipient is in there, mm. uh, the, uh, you know, the... <laughs> Even if it's made in a pharmacy, meaning not bootleg, mm -hmm. the amount that's required for propionate can give you uh, a feeling like you're getting the flu. 
and can and some people come in and say, "Oh God, Doc, I got uh, cellulitis back there," because it gets really red. Also, you have a mm-hmm. reaction, especially you know. Think about when you put alcohol on tissue; it mm-hmm. stings and mm-hmm. makes it red sometimes. So you're injecting that into the muscle, and you can cause. Uh, symptoms locally as well as you just kind of feel like uh, for a couple days Mm. even like I'm getting the flu. Some people react worse than others but you use Sipinate and you do just as well you know in terms of the testosterone levels but without the side effects. Again I've never understood it and this goes back I know we've talked about using Sustanon from back in the day the four different esters and that's a big farce too so I'll, I'll spare that but anyway if the question is, can I use testosterone with decadroblin, the answer is yes. The type, you know, which ester, I would suggest upgrading, if you will, to, to sipinate. It's easier and it should give you the exact same. Once you titrate it properly and find out what works best for you, it should mm-hmm. give you the same benefits. Now, in terms of the dose of decadroblin, though, which, again, isn't being made anymore, guys. So we're talking about Nandrolone, but that's the name of it, you know. Well, Watson, I think, in 94, was the last time they ever made the brand Decadrala. Mm. Now, you know, again, they call it Kleenex yeah, yeah. tissues, but now it's Nandrolone. So the studies, um, and I say studies plural, I know of one, there might be more, but it came out of Baylor with Dr. Lipschultz. They used uh, 100 milligrams once a week of nandrolone combined with a TRT dose, often enough, of I think uh, 200 milligrams. I'm not certain what the TRT dose was uh, across the board of the average. But the dose of decadrolin was 100 milligrams each week and it was used to very successfully treat joint pain. The problem with any anabolic steroid, I will say, again, is that all anabolic steroids will tend to reduce your HDL and raise your LDL, okay? They also tend tend to contribute to fatty liver disease. Why? Because first, you're telling your body to deposit as much energy into the muscle in the form of glycogen as possible. When that is full, the next step is to load it up in the liver. So, you know, I think we talked about this before too. The bodybuilders of old used to use the mic caps, or at least the inositol and choline to clean out the liver. Mm -hmm. Because they knew that after a lot of anabolic steroids, a lot of eating and sitting around and some working out, uh, in, in a big push toward, toward putting on muscle mass that their livers would get fat. So, um, as is usually the case, the poison is in the dose. There were no... The problem is there wasn't any testing that I'm aware of to see what the liver fat content was or what the lipid profile was before and after. Mm. But it was deemed safe to use decadroblin, again, a 100 milligram dose per week with males, and efficacious to help with joint pain. It's not healing the joints, guys, hear me, we know yeah. that, but it's helping with the pain. Um, so can you do that to your 90? I don't know, but here's what I would suggest. The way we would evaluate this, more specifically, would be to look at those markers. What happens to my HDL if I do this in a bigger study for a longer period? What happens to my LDL? What happens to my liver? Specifically, as judged perhaps using AST, ALT, and GGT. So what we could do is preempt, preemptively treat those. In other words, we could use some uh, controlled release niacin, for example, to try and keep the triglycerides lower and the HDL higher. We could use some, my preference would be to use red yeast rice to keep the LDL lower. Um, we could use um, some choline and inositol, either concurrently or periodically throughout to keep the liver clean. You understand yep. where I'm going with this? So yep. that we don't do any damage. Pretty certainly it's judged yeah. by the numbers. Yeah. yeah. And so my argument would be, and to answer your question, if done properly, yes, absolutely. You could probably do this to the day you drop, which hopefully be, you know, Hundred, many, many years past <laughs> ninety years old. As long as you're going strong, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thanks, Doc.